on the uh, on the MacBook, then I will just you know pull the Tascam audio and splice it into the video. Um, it'll Fancy. be so much fun. Yes, it's the twenty first <laughs> century, everybody. So, okay. so let me just let me just spawn up another window and move it off to one side. So, oh, now you're seeing all my magic. <laughs> If you want to put your passwords up there, that's cool, too. Uh, no, that's cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't use that bit. Use this bit. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, so what I have is a split-screen window. Um, on the bottom, I've got a TCP dump. Uh, you can ignore that long um, spewed mess. Um, what that is, is that's the filter, and that's a filter to mostly knock data down to just TLS. So it's ignoring my local network traffic and just, just going to TCP dump out um, uh, TLS stuff. Um, and additionally, um, I'm running a special patch. Well, not a special patch. It's the Apple standard, but it's, it's only on Macs, um, which is really nice. Any locally generated traffic, uh, it will actually tell you the process name in the TCP dump not just uh, the data. Oh, nice. This is purely so I... Oh, great. I can't even do my password. This is purely so I can show you um, that my tool is getting the right analysis of the fingerprints. Mm -hmm. So, like you can see uh -huh. here, that's a connection from Chrome. Yep. I don't know if it's readable on your screen, but it's a connection from Chrome. So if I run my tool on the top half, um, this will do a similar thing. So if I go, and I've got another window on another screen you can't see, but if I use curl to try and get uh, Google, you should see a line on TCP dump and my tool. Yeah. So my tool, oh, my tool actually did not, <laughs> did not um, match TCP dump because TCP dump didn't grab the process. But that's curl grabbing Google that I'm highlighting here. Okay. There's the tool getting curl there. Let's get one that doesn't upset it, like if I use Chrome. Oh, there we go. I open Chrome, and you can oh, see wow. mine say, here's Chrome listed off. You see the, the numbers here, the one, two, and three? That's what I was saying about multiple fingerprints for Chrome because mm -hmm. of padding. But you can see it's pulled the server name out. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see that's TCP dump, which normally you wouldn't have the process ID, but I'm capturing local traffic, so it's, it's able to pick that up. Um, so... Really, all that's showing is that it's able to sniff that off the wire, correctly identify um, what the client is, um, what TLS versions it's running, and then the host it's connecting to. Okay. Uh, you can't get full URLs, but you can get the host names, which, as I'm sure you can appreciate, in some cases is enough to know what someone's doing. Sure. Um, you know, there are some websites where you don't need to know the specific URL. The domain name alone will tell you what someone's what someone's thinking looking yeah. at so you uh, could you could definitely add like the google ads down there if you didn't want people to go in certain domains or having certain domains load you could actually almost use this for ad blocking couldn't you you could just say okay if it matches this yes. you know domain yes. and this fingerprint then you could you could kill it yes you could and actually oh. hooray this is just turned up if you see this here I'm actually outputting two things. This isn't the normal log file. Uh, that is a fingerprint for an unknown connection, which I deleted from the database. That's the Tech Secure desktop app, which you can tell because it gives the server name in the fingerprint for you to debug what it might be. Oh. Um, but that's, um, yeah, that's, the, that's what the Tech Secure desktop app looks like. So um, what you could do is take that, um, go to the big long JSON file that we've got here, which is basically the fingerprints, paste it in the bottom, rename the description to the tech secure desktop app, and um, you can start detecting straight away. Okay. So, I mean, that um, uh, it takes a little time to get tuned in until you get all your fingerprints, or do, does, does your application come with all of them loaded already? Uh, mine comes with them loaded. Uh, the fingerprints I've got come with it, but... Um, it automatically generates this JSON output uh, so that people can, you know, easily add them themselves. It keeps a little binary database. There's a Python script I've got that goes through that JSON file, sanitizes it, and dumps out a little binary um, that's consumed by the application. So um, 
you can you literally you just add it edit a text file i was doing in atom but obviously whatever you vim or notepad or whatever you like um run the python script once and then yeah the app will just pick it up and start going with it or it'll run uh you can't see it super well here but what it actually does is it says um a new fingerprint detected dynamically adding to the in-memory database so it'll it'll keep detecting it now like the next time that comes up in fact there we go it came up again further down here the connection to tech secure and it doesn't spew out the fingerprint again it just goes dynamic fingerprint zero has appeared again so that's what i meant about the tracking malware i can now see the app over and over again even if i don't know what it is i know it's that app whatever it is occurring frequently so oh you're visiting linkedin i see are you updating your resume for you know general, <laughs> general kickassery you know yeah yeah, yeah obviously <laughs> yeah yeah but uh, and so, that, uh, <clears throat> it's a very good point that that demonstrates why um people still need to be careful when encrypted because there's still a fair amount of information you can derive even though this is an encrypted session i'm not man in the middling it i haven't degraded the encryption in any way okay so how many um collisions are you getting um, that are from different apps on your fingerprints? Crazy low. <laughs> As in, I was expecting it to be really frequent. I was thinking I would have unique for the browsers because they're so specific about their cryptography. And then I would have everything compiled against OpenSSL, everything compiled against GNU TLS. And that would be largely me done. And they keep turning up. And in fact, when I did have collisions, they turned out not to really be collisions. Um, the one that springs to mind is um, I managed to fingerprint archive.org connecting to my um, web server when they go through archiving web pages. I was like, awesome. I have fingerprinted archive.org. This is great. And then it turned up as a collision. It collided with um, Java. Uh, and I was like, oh, well, that sucks. I'm finally getting to <laughs> And then I went to GitHub and had a look, and uh, the archive.org bot is written in Java. So it was ah. sort of, it was like, it's sort of a collision, but it sort of isn't, because it just uses the bog standard Java connection to make its connection. So it was actually fingerprinting it correctly. So it's sort of a collision, sort of not. Um, but for the most part, they don't. I can only think of like, three, four examples in the 250-odd signatures that are collision collisions. Um, and they're nearly all the same. Uh, then, then nearly uh, always um, like a shared library thing. So, for example, um, you will find that um, certain apps on OSX, for example, fingerprint the same as WebKit. And then you find that what the app actually does is it doesn't make its own, its own connection. It has embedded WebKit windows in the app. So it often looks like collisions. And then when you actually dig deeper, you find it's not really a collision. It really is just, just wow. WebKit. Um, now, how, so, what are, yeah. how, how OS specific can you get? I mean, obviously, if you have Internet Explorer, you're either run, you're running Windows. But I mean, can you say, OK, I'm running Chrome on an Ubuntu 1204 LTS box or this Chrome is running on a you know, Wiley Werewolf 1504? I mean, can, can you get can you get that specific? Uh, not off. Well, actually, it depends. Browsers, because of their decisions, they made the same decision on every platform, and because they enforce their rules, you know, uh, Firefox, you get to the version, but you don't get what platform it's running on, generally speaking. There are some exceptions. Cell phones and tablets sometimes place restrictions that mean that you can tell when that's the case versus a uh, desktop install. But I can't tell OS X Firefox from Linux Firefox, no. Okay. However, <laughs> however, once you get outside of browsers where people are not um, quite so stringent on how they set up their connections and they're often just like linking against system libraries and that kind of thing, uh, then you can actually tell the difference. Um, well, I was just thinking about maybe reading like the user agent string. Is that available in that packet or is that in another packet? No, the user agent string is inside the encrypted part of the communication. Ah, Anything that you would get from HTTP 
or or SMTP or any of the other protocols where you get the S and non S version, then nearly always what you've got is you've got TLS running the plain text protocol inside the TLS uh, packet. So um, TLS will set up the encryption, but if you bust open the encryption, HTTPS is just HTTP wrapped in TLS. So all those packets and everything, all those headers and everything are all encrypted. The only reason I have the host header. Um, it's like the chicken and egg thing with the crypto. Um, web servers need to present a certificate that matches the host name, but they can't present a certificate until they know what host name you're connecting to. Mm. So the host name has to go over in the clear as part of the, um, the uh, handshake in the first place. So that's why I'm able to extract the host name. But the rest of it, no, you can't tell anything about what's going on with the protocol. There are some guesses so you can make, which, which I don't do. Um, based on things like if you know what cipher has been chosen, you know what percentage it's likely to grow the payload. So based on the length of the reply, you can guess the length of the original payload, which makes you means you can guess what may have been in the protocol. But that's not a thing I've gone into. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's pretty deep. The um, the TLS handshake is that always Diffie Hellman? Um, the key exchange? It, you know what? That is a question that is probably beyond what I have looked at on there. Uh, oh. I need to reread to be sure of what everything supports. I must admit there are certain areas of this where I have not gone into massive depth on how it works because the way I've been working is I don't actually need to know how certain areas work. There's only parts of it that I do. And uh, the key exchange... I have largely ignored um, because uh, keying data, if done properly, is going to be unique to a session. So I've not been looking at how the... Oh, okay. Works. I thought that potentially the, um, the initial math uh, problem that was exchanged would be unique to a specific application, not unique to the session. I believe it's a session, unless I'm missing something. But I, but, okay. but anything to do with I, keying uh, and and the mathematical part. Uh, I well, I understand the computation based. would be unique yeah. to the session, but the initial um, the initial problem, right? Not the right. computation, but the problem. But um, yeah, you're probably right. It is unique. the The problem itself is unique to the session. So for and, a Diffie Hellman, you you do like A mod B, something like that, mm -hmm, and then each right. side would would um, would choose their X and Y. Um, so I was thinking that A mod B would be unique to the application, and then the um, the X and Y would be unique to the session. Very cool. But uh, you haven't seen that, so check. so you probably know better <laughs> than I. No, that's probably more me not checking than me saying that it's not the same uh but i can say that i went through everything to do with keys to see if there were similarities and from a cursory uh, as in not a djv maths breakdown kind of style but from a cursory look it didn't scream um being uh something that i could pick up on but that's not to say it isn't there could well be something i didn't look at I didn't look at anything to do with that involved sort of deep mathematics. It was much more the, um, the stuff that remained constant, as in literally like same number in same position in the packet kind of right. level. Okay. I mean, there could well be some kind of fingerprinting you could do, I guess, in terms of there's a number of things with keys. Like if hosts had limited entropy, if there's something you could derive by, you know, the numbers that they generated or something like that but i must yeah. confess they're not really going that deep right now yeah so i mean uh just before we had you on uh, a couple of weeks ago there was a well it wasn't a couple of weeks ago there was a blog post from cisco that they were talking about yeah. how malware is being is is using proper tls connections i mean like you know standard you know high quality tls connections and not like md5 or sha1 type connections yeah to help propagate or to communicate between uh what command and control hosts i would assume so from from right. what you're showing me at least on the demo it should be pretty easy for you to block 
with your IDS or your IPS, uh, a server name or something that would be out of the ordinary. Like, do a lot of the C2, I, I, I don't know a lot about the malware stuff. This would have to be something I'd ask Mr. Betcher's colleague, but do a lot of the C2 hosts only use IP addresses? Could that be something you could use to to block anything with an IP address or, um, you know, anything .ru, you know, could, could you do it by a regex in that, in that manner? Well, you probably could, but one thing I would say is that you could, um, you could probably, um, do it by fingerprint if they're using TLS. If it's a unique fingerprint, then you don't even need to know the hosts. You could, you could block by fingerprint if the firewall is capable of doing that. Okay. Um, yeah, or, or yeah, yeah. Or you could use it to extract IP addresses or something if you so wished. Um, it depends on, you know, like some malware has surprisingly small command and control, and then you hear of these ones that have such a distributed network that you're just going to play whack-a-mole because every time you block an IP address, they'll just move to mm. the next, especially if it's one of these that uses a time calculation to derive where it's going to connect or something. Yeah, yeah but see, the the good thing about this is you don't need to know all those different IP addresses that they keep changing on you because they have control over that. What they don't necessarily have that much control over is the software that they put on your platform. They can't change that on, on the fly. Right. So yes. by fingerprinting their initial handshake, um, you've got them there. Yeah, exactly. That was one of the things that I really should have mentioned. <laughs> yeah, you're completely right. Yeah, is the – yeah. To, to change an IP address, that just needs whatever method they're using, time, DNS, whatever. To change a fingerprint, you, you have to redeploy your software. In fact, recompile and redeploy the yeah. software. And yeah, that's a much bigger task for someone to have to deal with than, um, than, yeah, than changing IP addresses if you CNC. Very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously Cisco's reached out to you with all the uh, the malware that they've given you, right? And and been able to, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I can't say that right now because this, as we talked about on Twitter, this is going to be a couple of weeks in the future. So by the time that this airs, it, it, they might have actually contacted you. But so far, you've heard nothing from them as of the, uh, the 3rd of February. So uh, Yeah, I, I haven't currently, uh, but I mean, who knows? I'd have to comment on the blog post in the hope that they pick up that i'm doing this stuff so i'm hoping that they'll they'll share in focus i think it would be mutually beneficial if i can give them a way of detecting and acting on it and they could provide me the pcaps and i can actually sort of get the data and get some fingerprints out there for people because if this is that prevalent as they're saying then i think having the fingerprints Wait, out there for okay. anybody that has hang on Time out. I'm lost. Did I pass out and get abducted for a few minutes? What, what, were, you, what were you guys talking about, Cisco? And you didn't read the link you? down there, Cisco. Apparently, uh, me was... and every other listener didn't. <sighs> okay, so come on, guys. There's a link in the show notes. <laughs> okay, about um, uh, TLS being used for privacy and applications, and what. Um, so apparently uh, Cisco is using something called uh, data from Threat, Threat Grid, which is a malware analysis sandbox. And they found that malware is starting to use TLS connections for propagation and communication between uh, command and control servers and themselves and, uh, and other, right. you know, their, their other clients on the network. And, and that's news? Well, I, I saw it on Twitter. So, yeah, it's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's how I get all my news now. So, all right. Um, yeah, they said 98.25% of malicious TLS traffic they observed was HTTPS over port 443 or 443. And they were using um, uh, either, you know, other, other SSL or TLS ports like 993, which is IMAP over SSL, or 995, which is POP3. They also found port 500, which is ISACAMP, which is the. Uh, TLS uh, or the SSL VPN connections for for SSL connections. So they were talking about how um, you know malware uses the TLS protocol, and you know they got some fancy graphs in here. And I, I sent this on to Lee because I was like, oh yeah, hey, we're going to be talking about TLS fingerprinting. Is this something that your TLS fingerprint app or application would be able to find? And he's like, oh yeah, sure, no problem. And uh, so he had made a, a comment on the at the end of the article about he's using techniques to fingerprint TLS connections, and he, you know, he put, he pimped out his his blog at Square Lemon, <laughs> and uh, you know he was so, so Lee, um, some 
If you need if you need some samples, I can I can give you some samples. He knows a guy. That would be great. I mean, if there if there are samples, I'll happily run them through it. It takes two seconds. And I'll put the <laughs> fingerprints out, and I'm just thinking. I don't want to turn. You it have into to like be careful a, though. With what? Sorry. Uh the samples that oh, I give you. Samples. Oh, I think yeah, you meant yeah. PCAP samples. Yeah, no, he'll <laughs> happily infect your drive for you there, Lee, if you want. You know? uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm cool. I, I, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, I don't want to turn it necessarily into like a full antivirus thing. But if there's um, if there's malware that's out there using TLS, I don't see any issue with putting the signature in there. And if people see those signatures, at least using it as a flag to go and investigate something, if nothing else. Okay. Um, Man, this is uh, this is awesome. Okay, um, wow. I need to incorporate. Okay, so you need to get a Windows version going, so I can incorporate this in, in the lab <laughs> that I use. Well, and I it'll just be another signature that I can that I can put, um, you know, in my list of signatures for each uh, type of nefarious uh, application that I come across. That would be awesome. Well, I I mean, I, I would love to. I have absolutely. No idea how well it works on Windows. I mean, it's written to be portable. It compiles on Linux, BSD, and OS X with both Clang and GCC. So it's as portable as I could make it. <laughs> I know Windows yeah. always needs like some kind of cludge to make it work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know whether if I did it under Sigwin or something, whether it might work. I'll have a look. I must admit, it's not that I'm saying it doesn't work under Windows. It's I haven't tried. <laughs> Well, you need to build an app called Enu. It's wine backwards. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Works in VMware, though. Well, there you go. So if you, if you could run that. Well, yeah, you could you could probably do that and then set up the networking so that you were sniffing traffic um, on, the, on the Windows box. In fact, in all seriousness, if you want to get going on Windows with it quickly, that was something I forgot to mention. It doesn't just live sniff. It will take PCAP files. So if you want to sniff on Wireshark or something, save a PCAP and play it back. It'll open a PCAP file natively and do just the same. Very, Very nice. good. Okay. Well, that was awesome. I uh, I'm so glad that we were able to finally get you on, even though you know you were you're a busy guy. You're jet setting. You know you're flying around <laughs> Leviathan's <laughs> Gulfstream Five. You know helping out people. Like I That's understand exactly what my life you know, is like. Bottle service. You know making it rain. I I get you. It's cool. You know that that whole. <laughs> glitzy consultant life you know so um for for people who have not listened to our prior podcasts uh, that you've been on and they damn well better you know put that down for homework where would they get a hold of you on the on the you know out there on the internets okay so twitter it's synaps <laughs> geniusly made an unpronounceable one so s-y-n-a-c-k-b-s-e uh or squarelemon.com, which is my blog. Uh, or leviathansecurity.com if you want professional consulting. <laughs> oh. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. I... Are you part owner yet? <laughs> yeah, you should. No, I'm not. <laughs> totally should be. I, and you're also, um, you have the, the at fingerprint TLS yes, Twitter that's handle. The... Yes, I got that just for the uh, app. So people that are interested in that but not interested in anything else I do can just follow that and get like a filter down just to do with this version. Yeah. Oh, and so, your app's on uh, GitHub. So, I mean, if they search for you, it is, they yes. can find you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It, yeah, it's just Lee Brotherston is the user on GitHub. So Very cool. All it's right. Easy. I shoved it in the in your show notes document as well. So yeah, yeah, just check out the show notes. It's got a bunch of articles in his GitHub, and actually, he's got the videos from Sector. And is that the YouTube uh, from DerbyCon, or is that is that it another is one? Indeed. Okay, no, that's DerbyCon. Yeah, very cool. All right, and then of course, I actually put a fancy graphic in there that kind of shows the uh, the the TLS handshake. I've got a couple examples in there. Ooh, so. hey you. I know, right? I got to do something because I was totally lost on the whole map thing there. I was told there was no map. <laughs> there is. So, uh, Mr. Betcher, how would people get a hold of you if they wanted to? Uh, they can reach me on Twitter. Just uh, I am me. I'm uh, at Betcher Pwned, B O E T T C H E R P W N E D. 
did you have to think about <clears throat> yeah you thought about that one for a second i, I felt that so um <clears throat> and also um don't you have a you have a website as well for your application that you had mentioned in the podcast you, you know people might want to synergize lees with yours yeah you can go to imfsecurity.com there you go might as well pimp out everybody since everybody's got a company now you know entrepreneurship you know whatever <laughs> so so, um, so when you bought your um your new mac book that you were talking about uh -huh. your old one busted yeah is that under your company name so you could like take a tax deferral um i don't know if cascadia security and consulting patent pending uh is is <laughs> gonna do that i i got a mac mini because i i actually picked up a big fat lenovo with 32 gigs of ram in it because i was wanting something a little more beefy so um yeah. Is it pre-pwned? It, it has all the super fish I ever want on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, to, to get back to how people can get a hold of us, because that's important, uh, we're uh, at BreakSec. The official podcast uh, Twitter is at BreakSec, uh, B-R-A-K-E-Sec. You can find me at Brian Break. That's B-R-Y-A-N-B-R-A-K-E. Uh, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn. We are on a gob of different networks i mean player fm tune in radio uh stitcher uh god there's just too many to mention uh and it's actually been helpful because it's uh helped uh people find us which is excellent it's always good for people to find us let me see if i can click on those uh jay shulman just posted a podcast today three february it's going to be a little late by the time it comes up but he uh he did an interview with us uh about uh, our lives and everything so that was good uh we're on tumblr we have an rss feed if you have comments or questions hit us up at bds.podcast at gmail um yeah so that's it lee are you going to be talking anywhere in the next uh, few months are you going to be at defcon or the black hats or the uh well rsa will be over by the time this posts but uh <laughs> were you at the uh, rsa I did you like it <laughs> <laughs> no nope, i wasn't there and i won't be there no i have no idea uh i have not I, I don't know about speaking. I haven't arranged any speaking this year yet. Uh, conference so far, I've just been to Shmoo, um, and I have yet to book up the rest of the year. The plan is, unless something goes horribly wrong, I'll be at the Vegas Trio at the very least. Okay. Uh, oh, and Sector and B-Sides Toronto, for sure. Everything else is a we'll see currently. <laughs> awesome. Okay. All right. Well, Lee, appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, keep... Keep on keeping on and uh, kicking ass, and that this was <laughs> awesome. I, I I'm definitely going to listen to this one again just to to catch all the nuances I missed and and learn the maths and, um, yeah, that was it for breaking down security. I hope everyone had a great week, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. And we're clear. Right on, man. That was awesome. So Lee, how how'd you get tickets to Shmoo, man? <laughs> Mad skills. <laughs> no. Uh. Um, yeah, I know. I uh, it was totally a. I've learned the trick with Shmoo now. The trick is don't even try and get tickets. It's much like um, like DerbyCon is at the last minute. The people that could get tickets, so many people go. Oh, I got through. Buy four. Buy four. And then and then the boss goes, No, nah, like you're not going. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> and, okay. and in the last two weeks, if you just watch Shmoo as a hashtag. Mm -hmm. The number of people that are like, yeah, selling at face value, whatever, <laughs> you can just jump on. Like, I got me in, uh, and then I got another couple of friends. I managed to get hooked up with tickets by just doing the, by like having to see the thing and messaging them, like, oh, speak to this person now. Yeah. <laughs> like, and they, they go and do it. But so long as you're happy to turn up in DC with 150 bucks to pay face value, like at the bar with someone or whatever, which I mean, as it happens, the person I did it with was someone I knew anyway. They just didn't know I was looking for tickets. And I was like,